Thank you for calling loops for you the ultimate source for all your loopy needs. For Wilson loops, please press 1. For Ethof loops, for the definition of Wilson loops, press 1. For coupling to more matter fields, press 2. If you are interested in 3D n equal to quiver gauge theories, press 3. For BPS Gaioto Yin Wilson loops, it's 4. If you have issues with BPS fermionic Wilson loops, press 5. Everything related to Wilson loops and grated quivers, it's 6. For discussion, all other issues, or to speak to a customer representative, please press 7. Please make a selection. You have chosen Wilson loops. Consider a field phi at the origin in the fundamental of your gauge group, UN or SUN. It transforms under gauge transformations to lambda times phi. If you have the conjugate at position x, it will transform with the inverse of lambda on the right, lambda evaluated at point x. To compare the two, you would need to parallel transport phi from the origin to position x, and to do that, use the open Wilson line w0x, defined as follows. This depends on the path. Now that you have phi parallel transposed to x, you can form the composite with phi bar w and phi, and this composite is gauge invariant. You could also parallel transpose back with w tilde along a different path, then the product of these two parallel transports from 0 to x and back from x to 0 transforms under gauge transformations as the adjoint at the origin. So then you can take the trace of it, and the trace is gauge invariant. This is the Wilson loop. For the definition of Wilson loops, press 1. For coupling to more matter fields, press 2. You can couple Wilson loops to more matter fields. So now consider two gauge groups, u and 1 and u and 2. You can have a field phi 1 in the fundamental of u and 1. With phi 1 of 0 and phi 1 bar at x, we can form a composite including a Wilson loop with a connection of the first group. If we have the field phi 2 and phi 2 bar in the fundamental and anti-fundamental of the second group, we can likewise do the same with a connection from the second group, w2. We can also consider the adjoint fields sigma 1 for the first group and sigma 2 for the second group. They can be inserted in the middle of a Wilson loop. So if we have a Wilson loop going from 0 to x in group 1, then we can have sigma 1, but it doesn't end there. We need to connect it to another Wilson loop and so on until we get something closed, or we close it with a fundamental field. Likewise for sigma 2 and the second gauge group. We can also have fields in the bifundamental representation, so the fundamental of u and 1 and the anti-fundamental of u and 2, or vice versa. Now if we start with a Wilson line in the first group, going from 0 to x, we can attach there the anti-fundamental field of the first group, or we can attach there the adjoint of the first group, or we can attach the bifundamental psi 1, 2 bar, but in that case we need to continue with another Wilson line, this time of the second group, w2, from x to y, and then we have to attach sigma 2, or psi 2, phi 2 bar, or psi 1, 2, and continue like that, and we can close it after an even number of psi's. So, what are quiver gauge theories? It is a way to define the matter content of certain field theories. In this case, this is three-dimensional theories with n equal 2 supersymmetry, which is very closely related to four-dimensional n equals 1 supersymmetry. And it's made out of a diagram with nodes and arrows. The nodes represent ve vector multiplets. In this case, we have u n 1 and u n 2. Each of them has a gauge field. Sigma and d are auxiliary fields. And then there are the gluinos, lambda, and lambda bar. The edges are chiral fields in the bifundamental representation. They contain the scalar phi, fermion psi, auxiliary field f, and also the antichiral that we need in order to write down an action, which are not represented in this graph. They are, of course, in the conjugate representation such that we can get singlets. The action 
is not written explicitly, but it should include a kinetic term for the chiral fields, the usual gauged chiral Lagrangian. And it can include a Young-Mills term, chain Simons terms, both for the gauge fields, and there can be superpotential terms. None of these terms are specified in the diagram. They are important to define the theory. But for our purposes today, which is classifying supersymmetric loop operators, this doesn't play any role. You have chosen Wilson loops. Consider a field phi at the origin. BPS Wilson loops in 3D theories were first discussed by Gayoto and Yin. I will consider a theory on the three sphere, and here the theory has a single vector multiplet. The main idea is to replace the gauge connection A with A minus I sigma, where sigma is the auxiliary field in the vector multiplet. And you define the Gayoto Yin Wilson loops as follows, where R is a representation of your gauge group UN. To understand this insertion of sigma, you can just think of it in terms of a Taylor expansion, where you have the Wilson loop without any insertion. To that, you add the Wilson loop with a, sig a single sigma integrated around the curve. And then the next term in the expansion will have two integrals with two sigmas inserted at arbitrary points along the loop, and so on. For this to be supersymmetric, the path has to be a great circle on S3. And it preserves a pair of supercharges, so it is 1 half BPS. Since we fixed the path to be a great circle, the only information we have to classify them is by their representation. For every representation, there is a single Wilson loop of this class. BPS fermionic loops were found by me and Diego Trancanelli over 10 years ago, and the explanation I provide here is based on a recent paper with Maxime and Malte. Here, let me discuss the theory with the following quiver with two nodes, and you can define a connection L0 involving both gauge fields, and it is an N1 plus N2 times N1 plus N2 matrix, and I shifted the second connection by 1 over 2R. The reason for that is a technical reason that will be important later. The Wilson loop based on this L0, W0, is the supertrace of the path ordered exponential of the integral of L0 along the circle, taken in a representation of un1 plus n2, or un1 slash n2, as a supermatrix. Because of this shift and the supertrace, it is equal to the sum of the two Wilson loops separately for the gauge group A1 and the gauge group 2. The important thing is that if we take the supercharge Q and a matrix G that is off diagonal, then the combination LG, which involves Q of G and G squared, has the following property that the supersymmetric variation of LG is a total derivative of G with a connection that is LG. Now we can construct the Wilson loop based on this matrix G as the supertrace path ordered exponential of e to the integral LG. Its supersymmetry variation is not zero automatically because supersymmetry variation of L is not zero, but it's a total derivative with the same connection. So we can integrate it by parts, the boundary terms vanish, the supertrace guarantees that, and we get that the total variation is zero. So now we have many more Wilson loops that will depend on the matrix G, and the choice of the matrix G in this case involves the scalar field in the bifundamental phi in the off diagonal and phi bar, each of them multiplied by an arbitrary constant u and u bar that don't need to be complex conjugates of each other. We have two arbitrary complex parameters, so we have a much larger class of Wilson loops. We can still take the Wilson loop in any representation of the combined UN plus UN1 plus UN2 group. Explicitly, the new connection includes on the diagonal, in addition to A plus sigma, also the bilinear of the scalars in the bifundamental. And in the off diagonal, it includes the fermions. This is because we included Q times G and G squared. Now we can see that if we conjugate the matrix G by the diagonal matrix with a one in the X, 
and its inverse, this will rescale u by x and u bar by 1 over x. This is a diagonal a gauge symmetry in SUN1 plus N2, which is not in SUN1 or in SUN2. It's a new gauge symmetry that was not considered before. The Wilson loop is invariant under it. So we have this symmetry, and actually we don't have two independent complex parameters because only their product u times u bar matters. So how are Wilson loops related to graded quivers? Let me generalize the previous construction by taking L0 to involve on the diagonal P copies of the first gauge connection and Q copies of the second gauge connection, both with the extra I sigma and the second one also with extra 1 over 2R. And now the matrix G will involve many more entries, all of them multiplying the bifundamental fields phi, but I'm going to have P times Q U's and the same number of U bars. This construction has a much larger gauge symmetry, which is now GLP times GLQ, all that modded by one C star. And I represent it by the following quiver, where the circles still represent the nodes, but now the number inside them represents the number of copies of the gauge group appearing in L0. And I represent by a squiggly circle the node that got shifted by 1 over 2R. In this diagram, I double the arrows to indicate both the U's that couple to the chirals and the U bars that couple to the antichirals. The total moduli space is the number of parameters U, U bar, which is C to the 2P times Q, all that modded by the gauge symmetry, which is essentially GLP times SLQ. Such quotients are known to mathematicians as quiver varieties, and they were also studied in the context of supersymmetric field theories by Hanani and Witten, where they looked at moduli space of three-dimensional theories. Let me look at more examples. So if I take, again, the product of two gauge groups, but with a pair of Cairo bifundamentals, then the simplest fermionic Wilson loop will include one and one in the two nodes, and there will be one parameter for every chiral field, so I will call them u and v, and for the anti-chiral fields it's u bar and v bar. In total we have four parameters, and the gauge symmetry, extra gauge symmetry, is just c star, so we have c to the fourth modded by c star. This is known as the conifold, which arises in many contexts in string theory. The Wilson loops I described so far uh, are invariant also under the second supercharge Q minus that the bosonic gaiotto yin wilson loop was invariant under, so they are one-half BPS. The condition for that is that all the solid arrows point into the squiggly circles. If a solid arrow points out of the squiggly circle, you will not find invariance under Q minus, just over Q plus. Let me look then at another example of ABJM theory. Now the theory has four chiral fields, two in the bifundamental, two in the anti-bifundamental. And we have several choices of Wilson loops. So we can choose the right node to be shifted, indicated here by a squiggly circle, or we can choose the left one. And then if we look for the more supersymmetric Wilson loops that preserve two supercharges, which in the context of ABJM means 1 6 BPS, and if p is equal to q equal to 1, this is essentially the same story as above. It's a conifold. Of course, if p and q are larger, we can also calculate it, and the moduli space is a more complicated manifold. If we include the coupling to all the chiral fields and anti-chiral fields, then we find a Wilson loop that is invariant only under a single supercharge. That means it's 112 BPS in ABJM counting, and in the example, when p equals q equals 1, we have eight parameters modded out by one gauge symmetry. So we find the manifold C8 modded by C star. All of our representatives are currently busy. Please stay on the line, and we will be with you shortly.
Your call is very important to us. Please stay on the line and the Wilson Group expert will be with you shortly.